Hi there, and welcome to OnCon 4. I hope you guys are having a good time. I know that I am. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Steve Gearhart. I do a little um, YouTube channel called the Inagi Observer. I talk about anime, manga, Asian stuff, um, other fandoms, kind of like, you know, sci-fi, comics, things like that. So if you want to check my channel out, please, please, by all means, come to the Inagi Observer. Um, and that was my shameless plug before the panel. Speaking of which, what is this panel? Today's panel is, or at least this one, is going to be about um, history that you can find in anime. Now, there's a ton of history that you can find in anime, and so I'm only going to focus on about three particular subjects, and I'm going to talk about them in, here in a moment, but before I do, just a couple things. Um, first of all, unfortunately, I can't really show any video because this is YouTube. And if it's uh, if I put something accidentally that's not uh, I don't have license to show, we might shut down OnCon by a uh, accidentally, and we don't want that. So there's not going to be any video. Um, there might be some ambient noise. I say this a lot because I live in a city, Baltimore, to be specific, and there's a lot of noise that goes on around me. Anything from traffic to people yelling, sirens, bullets, shooting. Things like that. So if you happen to hear those in the background, it's okay. Uh, it's per perfectly fine. So with all that said, let us start with history in anime. So for this segment, I want to talk about Summer Wars. I loved Summer Wars. That was a really great movie. Um, on first glance, it seems like a rom-com, uh, you know, it's um, Shy Boy has pretty classmate, pretty classmate needs his help, um, takes him home, and then he finds out that the help is actually him pretending to be a boyfriend slash fiance to satisfy the desires of the grandmother who wants to make sure that her granddaughter is marrying a proper gentleman or man. And uh, so that's, that's, you know, on first glance, that's what the story is. But you, as you watch the movie, as you get into it, you come to discover that there's a lot of history and it shapes the story. It shapes the narrative. The first sense of that he's coming into history is when he's going up the ramp to his classmate's house. And he's kind of expecting, you know, just the normal Japanese suburban house and he was walking up this huge ramp and gets there and he finds that he's standing in front of a gate of a castle, a garrison gate. Like, as in this like big, huge thing, walls, door that yet yeah, so heavy that you kind of have to really kind of push it open. So he's standing there and he's just like, oh, huh, wait a minute. Is my classmate rich? You know, so he's trying to figure this out. And as they go in, you know, of course, it's traditional Japanese castle. Very beautiful koi ponds, gardens, the whole nine yards. You get inside the actual castle itself, and there is many, many rooms, many hallways, interior gardens, and things like that. So he's making his way, following her, trying to not get lost. And as they're going through, he gets a really good idea of how historic this place is, because there is a good scene that lasts probably about three or four seconds where you see a suit of armor, two naginatas, and swords. And he's walking past it, and this is when he starts to realize, I'm in a place of history. I'm in a place that has lineage. So when he finally meets the grandmother, he's freaking out because he's discovering that, yeah, it's a place of lineage, all right. It's a major clan. So he realizes that he's in the Genucci clan, a uh, uh, kind of historical base of power. This is, has been their fortress that's been in their family for, you know, not just generations, but centuries. <laughs> so he's kind of freaking out and he doesn't know what to do. Now, the rest of the movie plays off of the clan structure and their history, the clans, the Genucci clan's history. Um, obviously, the Genucci clan does not exist. It is played off of a real clan called the Sonata clan. I'll get into that in a moment. But it's um, a lot of the events that happen and how the plot progresses is mirrored in the history of the Genucci clan, which is based in real history. So, um, 
one of my favorite characters in this movie is what I is, is a guy who actually talks about the history. And when he talks about the history, he's actually talking about the Sonata clan. But of course, he's calling it his clan, the Junichi clan. And he's, like I said, one of my favorite characters. And he's also very loud. He's a fisherman. And he's an uncle in this very large clan. And he, I just like to call him Uncle Mustache. Okay, so now we get the guy who gives us the, 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 the history of the clan. But what is a clan and why is that important? Why is that important to Summer War? So let's talk about what clan structure is. In Summer Wars, we are treated to a family dinner. Grandmother sits at the head of the table. So many members of the Janucci clan are there. Kenji's there, sitting there, pretending that he's the fiance. And you see and hear and meet the cousins, the brothers, the sisters, the daughters, the granddaughters, the grandkids. All these people, part of the Janucci clan, eating dinner, having a wonderful time. It's a warm moment. It's a solid moment. You see the solidarity in terms of family. And, that, and when you think of it that way, then you understand the concept of clan in that sense, in the familial sense. And that the power all drives from the grandmother, everyone takes direction from her, she's given respect. And then as things progress, as the story progresses, we learn what it actually means to be a clan. Because in the sense of uh, history, clan doesn't necessarily mean family. It, it, it does in that it's a ruling family. But there's a far more rules and obligations that you have to follow. In other words, you've come to discover that Janiji clan not only is a strong family unit, but they have strong ties to the community. And there's certain obligations that they have to the community and that the community has to the Janoji family. And that's the whole point of a clan structure. So how did clans come about and why is this important? So clans in Japan have existed for centuries, okay? And they go back before there was an emperor, and they go back before there were, you know, multiple kings and queens ruling various parts of Japan. It goes back to primitive days. So the idea, the concept of a clan goes way back. Now, what we're going to talk about in terms of the style of the Genochi clan in Summer Wars, we're going to talk about it starting as the imperial type of clan, because that's actually what we're, we're focusing on. And basically, it's power sharing. Clan structure is power sharing, and it's power sharing between a group of people and the emperor and the imperial court. So what happens is that the emperor looks around and he'll see a group of people. And these people live in a specific area and they do these specific things in this area. And there's a ruling family or a group of people who are connected somehow, usually by blood, that are taking care of things. And so the emperor decides we're going to give these people a clan name. By giving the group a clan name, it makes them part of the imperial court. And in that way, they have like power and status. Now, we're not talking like they can do whatever they want or anything like that, but they become kind of like a citizen, if you know what I mean. So they have certain rights. They have certain abilities to do certain things as a clan member, as a member of such and such clans. Now, what about the ruling family, the family that actually takes care of this group? Well, they're given hereditary titles. These hereditary titles are where the actual power is. So they give this ruling family of the clan, they say, okay, here's your clan name, it's Janucci. So you have your regular name, but we're gonna call you by this name. This helps us identify where you are in the world, meaning where's the location of your, your group of people, and you are going to represent us in ruling the clan. And when the clan deals with you, you are representing the face of the emperor. So it's a big deal, it's kind of important. So you don't wanna screw it up, so to speak. And it's a way also to make sure that a grouping of people doesn't rebel against you by giving entitlements to, the, to those that are ruling over the clan. Now, there are different levels of power within that. So some clans have more power and some clans have less power. And it has largely what to do with what your clan overall can do for the state. In other words, can you make a lot of rice? Now, 
keep in mind the economy of Japan is based on the production of quality rice at this time. So if you have, if your clan goes over a large spans of farmable land and they're able to make a lot of rice, you're going to be powerful. And your ranking as a clan goes higher in the imperial court. Keep in mind, this doesn't necessarily make you a noble but it gives you a voice in the imperial court. And sometimes your voice can be more important than a noble. It kind of depends on what you can provide the emperor, the imperial court, and the nation as a whole. Now, if you're a small clan, and you have on a chain of islands, like say the Tanakashima Islands, which are really tiny islands, and you can't really grow rice there, but you can grow sugarcane, your entitlements in the imperial court are going to be small. You're not going to get that much because you're not producing that much for the imperial court. So to each their own. So if you can do a lot for the state and you do it, the state will turn around and reward you. If you can't, well, at least if you run into trouble, you can always go to the imperial court and say, hey, I'm being invaded, and they'll try and help you. Okay. So there's things that, that still benefit you from being a clan, even if you're a small clan with, with very little entitlements. Those entitlements are passed down to the next generation, which is also important. That means that the name, the power, can continue as long as the ruling family of the clan continues. So all these entitlements, all these things, are meant to tie you to the imperial court so that you will do what they say. And it helps, lets them do what they want to do because they know that you, as the ruling clan, are going to take care of business at that level. So what does that mean? That means that you take care of policing things, of protecting the area with, uh, with whatever troops that you can muster. Um, it means making sure that um, you know, if natural disasters happen, that you have a quick response, that you keep your people healthy. You keep, the, you keep the cogs going is basically what they're asking you to do. And in response, they give you a name and entitlement. So that's basically clan structure. So the Genuchi clan, when you see them mobilize in, in, in later on in the movie, as they do their part doing what they're supposed to do as leaders of the clan, you come to realize that as grandma is mobilizing people, that they're pretty far high up on the food chain. So if you know Summer Wars, you know that the bad thing happens. And the bad thing that happens is that basically the the internet is taken over by Love Machine. For those of you who haven't seen it, yes, that is the villain's name, Love Machine. Just watch the movie. It all makes sense. It's still a good movie. <laughs> anyway, so there's a point where things are breaking down. Social order is breaking down. Lights are not working properly. Phones aren't working properly, like cell phones. Communication, internet is down fake phone calls, fake calls for help, uh, false alarms. All these things are happening and they're, they're kind of really disrupting the world, right? And Japan in particular. And so as things are kind of like society is sort of falling apart and people are identifying what's happening, um, that's when grandmother springs into action. And as the leader of the clan, of the Genuchi clan, she puts the clan to work, okay? So what she does, and she goes to her brilliantly, rotary phone, which cannot be affected <laughs> by Love Machine, and starts making phone calls. What she's doing is that she's doing what traditionally a ruling member of a clan would do, mobilize the clan. There's a threat, something's happening, there's a flood, we're being invaded, whatever the crisis is, mobilize the clan. Get the people together, marshal your forces, give the orders, deal with it. So that's what grandmother is doing. She's that she's calling people up and she's trying to get an idea of what's going on out there. So she's calling all the members of the family that live in the immediate area. So she's calling the nephews and the grandchildren who have jobs like EMTs, police officers, uh, firemen, and they're all calling back and saying, hey, yeah, it's really weird because, uh, you know, we're getting all these false alarms and stuff, but you know, we, we don't know what's going on. And she turns around and she says to them, keep doing your job. You're a member of the Genoshi clan. Your name has weight. That you have responsibility, you have an obligation to the people around you. I'm very proud of you. 
do your job. Make sure everyone is safe. So the Nanucci clan says, oh, we got our orders. Let's do it. So out of respect of, not just out of respect of the grandmother, but understanding who they are as part of this clan and their obligation to the community. This is why they do what they do. So it's this great moment where you see all these members, different members of the Genucci clan who can do things, who can impact things, are out there and they're doing it. They're tired, they're exhausted, but they keep going because grandmother, the ruling member of the clan says, we gotta protect what's ours. So that's what a traditional clan, ruling clan member would do, protect their community. Also what they do is they would call in the favors, right? Okay, so if you are in a clan in feudal Japan and you are part of the imperial court, that means that if you think you need help, you can contact other people and get that help, or at least try to. You see grandmother in summer wars calling people and suddenly you start to realize that she knows people, she's connected, and she's made it part of her life to make sure those connections are maintained. So she's pulling out all these phone books, like, you know, the personal phone books, and she's going, tch, tch, tch. Oh, I'm going to call this guy, gets on the phone. And then you realize that she's talking to the governor of the prefecture, right? So she's making demands of those above her, above her, to help her out. This is what the clan does, the ruling members of the clan do. They go out there and they say, we need help, you owe us. We've been taking care of things for you for a very long time pay up. It's your turn. So grandmother is going hardcore. She's mobilized the clan. She's getting them out there. They're doing their thing. She's turned around. She's going to the government, Japanese government, going, yeah, you better step up now. And they do. And that's the power of a clan. That's the power that's, you know, they recognize that there is a certain stability in this region that she is showing by having her clan stabilize what's going on around. So the sons, the daughters, the nephews, all these people are stabilizing this one little area and they're saying, hey, more help is needed. You better do something. We've done our part, you do yours. And that's the beauty of the clan structure. Now, <laughs> this also kind of tells you, kind of tells you what, how far up the food chain the Genochi clan is in Summer Wars. If they're talking to the governor of the prefecture and saying, hey, do something, and they respond. That means that in the past, they were pretty well connected. They were probably not on par of the shogunate or anything like that, but they could actually probably get an audience with the emperor if they had wanted to back in the day. So that's, you know, kind of what the clan does. And so that's what's so interesting about Summer Wars is, is bringing up this clan structure, this clan concept, and how, you know, it, it's how effective it can be, and in particular with this anime, how it moves the story forward. Now, the other part I want to talk about a little bit is the actual history of not the Genochi clan, but who they are supposed to represent in real life, which is the Sonata clan. So while in Summer Wars the Genochi clan is fictional, it is based on the real life Sonata clan. The Sonata clan was located near Nagano, and it was one of the many clans that existed in that mountainous region. Of course, we get a wonderful history lesson from Uncle Mustache in Summer Wars about the Genochi clan and their many battles of which in the anime they claim to have lost. But what he's really referring to are the real life battles uh, that are called the two Ueda battles that the Sonata clan was a major part of. Many actual historians often talk about these two battles as the first and second phases of the one Ueda battle, even though the first phase occurred in 1585 and the second one happened in 1600. What's important to know is that the Sonata clan was the largest of the mountain clans in the area, and then they began to invade and take over the lands of the smaller clans around them, and that eventually led to the intervention of Tokugawa uh, Yasu in 1585. Yasu demanded that Masayuki Sonata give up those territories he just conquered back to the Hondo clan and Masayuki basically said, eh, no, I'm not going to do that. It turns out that Masayuki Sonata was a master strategist as he defeated Tokugawa Yasu's forces despite being vastly outnumbered. 
uh, Yasu eventually made peace, which he had to do because at that point Oda Nobunaga had just been assassinated um, by his people, and the war with the Toyotomi clan was just starting to heat up, so he had to make peace so that he could fight this other war. In Summer Wars, the battle that Uncle Mustache describes is actually the second phase of the Ueda battle, which occurred in 1600. Now, this is kind of important because at this point, this is when the Tokugawas and the Toyotomi factions are about to go head-to-head -head at the Battle of Sakurahara. A force under Hideyada Tokugawa, which was Iyasu's son, was supposed to meet up with his father at Sakurahara, but he was first tasked to bring down the Sanada clan. Now, Masayuki Sanada was again outnumbered. He had only 3,500 men going up against 38,000 Tokugawa troops. But Masayuki used the mountain terrain and the, the strength of his castles, and he managed to lure 2,000 Tokugawa troops inside of his castle walls and then close the main gates. Whereupon, all 2,000 Tokugawa troops were killed by archers manned on the walls. So at this point, Hideyata Tokugawa really wanted to take over this castle and take out Masayuki Sonata. But his advisor said, you know, look, it's only like 3,500 of them. We've got about 36,000 now. This ain't worth it. we got to be over the Sekirahara so we can support your father in the big battle. So let's go. And Hideyata said, nope, we're going to try and take the castle. And after a couple days, he did give up in trying to take the castle. Sonata held firm, they held the castle, they held the lands, and Hideyada Tokugawa would go on to the Battle of Sekirahara and miss the battle. He never fought in that battle. But the Tokugawa still won, which meant that the control of Japan underwent the Tokugawa regime. So, did Masayuka, Masayuki Sonata and his son sons die because they were in rebellion? The answer is no. Masayuki did something even more brilliant. What he did was this. He and one of his sons stayed behind and fought at the castle. He sent his nephew and another son to fight for Tokugawa Ieyasu at the Battle of Sekirahara. So no matter who won, at least the hereditary titles and the clan titles would still be maintained. So that was kind of brilliant. This isn't brought up in Summer Wars uh, when Uncle Mustache describes the, the battles of the Jinochi clan, but just wanted to throw out that it was kind of brilliant. So <laughs> anyway, that is the history of Summer Wars. In this segment, we're going to talk about the island of Dejima, or the concept of the island of Dejima, which is basically a way for a government or a, the people in power to deal with people that they don't want, really, or kind of dislike, but they don't have any real solution as to what to do with them, so they just take the whole population and they plop them on this piece of land and say, that's your home, we'll figure this out later and just stay there and just, just don't touch us, okay? Just please, just stay there. So that's kind of the idea of Dejima, both in anime and in real life. It's a band-aid solution to a problem that has no real good answer to it. And um, so before we get into the actual historical Dejima, let's talk about Dejima that, in, uh, that occurs in anime. Um, there's a lot of anime out there that has the concept of Dejima, but there's only a few anime that actually use the physical idea of Dejima. So let's talk about a couple of those. We can see the physical island of Dejima in anime like Ghost in the Shell. It's a place the Japanese government in the anime created by reclaiming land and creating a smaller city connected only by a long controlled highway to place the refugees that they felt somewhat responsible for from the previous world war. The Japanese government did not have a solution in which to deal with this population, so on this island, they continued to exist. Dejima itself is brought up in many other anime as the actual island itself, the actual historical island. Notably in Samurai Champloo, there are samurai come across a Dutchman who is wandering around the city of Nagasaki illegally, and the reason why this is illegal is because foreigners, Gaijin, cannot leave Dejima except for certain times of the year, or if called for by local Japanese lords. In Ghost in the Shell, the island is large enough to be a small city, a very small city, and in Samurai Champloo, its size is not really referenced, but considered large enough for a number of Gaijin to live on. Now, here's a historical picture of just how large Dejima had appeared to be in real history. 
which is to say it was not very big at all. Okay, to talk about Deja Mar, first we have to talk about the Portuguese. Now, the Portuguese were initially very good explorers. Uh, Prince Henry, uh, the navigator, he created the nautical sciences with which to or their ships to travel around the world and, and explore and find new places to set up new markets because the Portuguese wanted to be economic uh, masters of the world. They weren't, you know, they knew they weren't big enough to actually take land and control it, but they knew that they could have a very large and powerful economic empire. So that's what they did. They went out and they explored stuff, but so did the Spaniards. And they were about to come to heads and come to blows, and the Pope ste stepped in and said, okay, Spain, you get the west, Port Portugal, you get the east, don't bump into each other. So the Portuguese went east. <laughs> And they just basically followed the coastline. So they went around Africa, went around India, they you know, went around the, the Southeast Asian Peninsula there, Vietnam, Thailand, the Bangladesh, all those places. And they wound up in China. They did a little bit of trade with Korea, but China was their big trading partner in the Far East. So they set up a, uh, they went into the South Pacific a little bit, and they found and they made a uh, port in Papua New Guinea. And that's where, the, for the Far East operations, that's primarily where they operated out of. So they did a lot of trade uh, between the East and themselves. And so they were a major player. And because they did trade in China a lot, they knew that Japan existed. They came across Japanese merchants. So there was trade going on before the Portuguese actually went to Japan. Now the P Portuguese knew that Japan wasn't very keen on non-Asian foreigners, even at that time. They allowed the Chinese to come onto Jap the Japanese mainland, but only by permission. And it was really hard for white Europeans to be able to, to do that. So they, the Portuguese at first had no interest in setting up a port there. But that all changed in 1543 at the islands of Tanegashima. Now, here's what happened. There was a ship that was supposed to go from Papua New Guinea to China to do the spice trade route, right? So. They went into the South Pacific and a storm happened and the ship got blown off course and the mast was broken and they wound up in the Tanegashima Islands. The Tanegashima Islands are southeast of the main uh, Japanese islands. There are a very small group of islands. Uh, there's a very small population there. The clan is very small. They don't really grow rice, but they grow sugar. So here are these Portuguese that land there in 1543. And they come across the Japanese and they're a little bit nervous because they've heard the stories that the Japanese are just like, oh, white devils, kill them. So <laughs> that's a, that was a thing, unfortunately. And so instead they brought out their matchlocks and did a weapons display, which impressed um, the clan ruler, uh, Tanakashima, Lord Tanakashima. And a trade got set up. They said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you be here. We'll trade you some food. and." you know, find you a, a suitable tree to make a mast, a new mast out of. And, you know, we want you off the island as soon as possible. But, uh, you know, we actually like these matchlocks. So can we trade for a couple of those? Now, like I said, Tanegashima grew sugar, not really rice. Rice is, is what um, fuels the economy for Japan at this time. So sugar doesn't really mean much in the Japanese economy. However, to the Portuguese, sugar is wow, this is great. This is like a gold mine because you can process sugar into many other things to create many other products. So this is a big deal. So the trade happens. And as a result, the Tanegashima, Lord Tanegashima says, hey, look, we're not part of the mainland, so we can kind of get away with things because we're kind of far away. So why don't you keep coming back? We'll do trade with you. So keep coming back. And the Portuguese did. It got to the point where people on the mainland knew what was happening and the technology of the matchlock, the Tanegashima matchlock, went to the mainland and that's a whole other story for another day. <laughs> but they also learned that the Portuguese were also engaged in the trade of spice and goods and were particularly adept with the Chinese. So they were allowed to come into the Nagasaki Harbor. So the Portuguese said, oh, Oh, okay, we'll come to the city of Nagasaki. So they went in there and they set up shop and they started doing a trade and they cornered the silk trade with China in Japan. Nagasaki becomes a boom town. Everyone's happy except the Portuguese, as usual, screw it up. How did they screw it up? 
Well, I'm so glad you asked. One of the things that they did, which is something that the Japanese rulers had a problem with, was the spread of Christianity. So they weren't really keen on that. Well, when you're a Portuguese trader, when you're a merchant trader, whenever you ship leaves, each ship leaves by law with a priest, a Catholic priest, so that the priest can protect the crew, you know, pray to God and protect them, and also to spread the word of God. Well, they went to Japan and they spread the word of God and pretty soon many Japanese started going into the Christian faith. Well, the rulers at the time, the shogunate, was like, uh, we're not really keen on this. And there's something else that we're also not really keen on. And this is what was happening. Poor families would look at their daughters, 12 on up, go to the Portuguese and go, we would like to sell you our daughter. So a weird little Lolita slave trade kind of occurred. I know, ew, right? So anyway, the Portuguese were like, okay, yeah, sure. It's a way, in it. it's a way to make bucks. So yeah, okay, we'll do it. So they started importing young Japanese women between 12 and 16 to Europe to sell to the gentry and you know, to have this spice in their life, I guess. I, 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 we're not gonna go too far into what they were gonna do with these young ladies. But nevertheless, it's an evil thing and it's an evil trade and the shogunate did not like that as well. Which meant they had to do something. And so Dejima was the answer they came up with. All right, so because the Portuguese screwed everything up, um, the local rulers and the shogunate said, okay, we're gonna have to really restrict foreigners here in Japan. Now, up to this point, um, they would allow foreigners, um, like people like the Dutch and the Portuguese, to come and set up ports and they would restrict them usually within the boundaries of the town or cities that they set up in. Now for the Chinese, it's a little bit different. They were able to travel the country a little bit more than the, than the white Europeans. The white Europeans pretty much had to stay where they were at. The Chinese could go out a little bit into the suburbs, but pretty much they had to stay in the city as well, but they had free run of the city. In other words, they could actually go anywhere inside of the city. Same thing as the white Europeans. So the Dutch made a major port over in Harada and the, um, and the Portuguese were in the fantastic harbor of Nagasaki, which did far more business than the harbor in Harada did. But because the Portuguese were going against the wishes of the shogunate and aggressively um, trying to convert anybody that they could come across, as well as then taking, buying the daughters of those people and then selling them to people back home, <laughs> the shogunate said, okay, we're gonna have to restrict you further. So not only did, were the Portuguese um, restricted in their towns, they were taken from other towns and put into Nagasaki. Then they said, okay, that's still not good enough. So we're gonna build, we're gonna build you, the Portuguese, a special little island, and we're gonna put all of you on this little island, and we're gonna keep you there. And we're gonna do the same thing to the Dutch. The Chinese, we don't have a problem with. So they create Dejima. Now the physical location of Dejima was originally a peninsula just on the inside of the mouth of a major canal in the city that emptied out into the bay or into the harbor. And so they said, okay, this is where you're going to be now and you cannot leave this peninsula. As a matter of fact, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go to the base of the peninsula and dig it out so that you are truly an island and you cannot leave it <laughs> because we don't want you on this side. So they started construction in doing that. Now, what happened was is that the Portuguese got worse and the Dutch were upright citizens. They didn't do the same things as the Portuguese did. They didn't really try to convert people. They didn't sell sex slaves, that kind of a thing. But the Portuguese doubled down and they kept doing it. So what happened was that in, six, in uh, fifth, um, I'm sorry, 1634, the construction of the island was finished and they had had enough with the Portuguese and they said, you guys get out. And they kicked the Portuguese out of the country. They looked at the Dutch and in the Harada Harbor, the Dutch were having a bad time economically. They just weren't making any money. And they said, you know what? Why don't you come into Nagasaki? We'll put you on Dejima 
you can't leave the island except under these rules. And, um, you know, hopefully things will be better because you're not doing the same things as the Portuguese did. And the Dutch said, thank you, thank you, thank you, and they left and moved to Dejama. Now, the other thing that happened later on in 1634 is very important. Once the Dutch were ensconced on Dejama, that meant that the only European presence was there, and the only European presence that could happen was in Nagasaki Harbor on Dejama Island. The Chinese, again, they were fine with white Europeans, not so much. So, what did they do? They did, they, they ushered in the practice of Sakoku, which is isolation from the rest of the world. So, the curtain came down, and that was it, and the only way you could trade with Japan if you were a European was through Dejama. The Dutch moved to Dejama. Now, there were several Dutch companies at Harada, but because Dejama was so small, they could only consolidate, and uh, they made one company, and its name I cannot pronounce, so we're going to call it by its letters and call it VOC. So the Dutch VOC Trading Company was created and that was basically the company that oversaw all European trade that went through Dejama. So the Dutch had a really good prosperous time of it. So while they were making money though, they had to live on this island, this little Dejama island, man-made island. So what was life like on that island? Well, like I said, it's small, like two acres small. That's how big it was. So only about 20 Dutchmen at a time were allowed to live there. And so they had barracks and homes for, to house them. They also had the warehouses for the ships that were coming and going from Europe to Nagasaki and later to China. And they also had room and barracks for the 50 Japanese uh, personnel who served as interpreters or people who were watching the Dutchmen to make sure that they didn't, anyth didn't do anything like the Portuguese would do, which is spread Christianity and or young girl slave trafficking, because, you know, that's just an ew thing, and who really wants that to happen? So anyway, so it's a very small island. It's only about two acres. It's separated from the mainland by having a canal dug between the in, through the peninsula, creating the island. And there is a bridge that goes across the water, and there's a gate on the island side, the Dutch side. So Japanese could come to the bridge, they could even go on to the bridge, but they couldn't go on to Dejama without permission. The people, the Dutchmen on Dejama, could not leave the island under specific circumstances. So they were pretty much there 24-7 almost the entire time of the year. Um, so it gets cramped. <laughs> It's not the best living quarters because think about it, it's two acres of land for about 70 people and there's really not much you can do if a ship isn't there, right? So <laughs> that's kind of how life is on Deja They made a lot of money, but they were bored a lot of the time, which worried the traders in Nagasaki and they said, well, you know, why don't we just, you know, make things nice and easy for them? And so they allowed specific type of brothels to send their geishas over the bridge with permission, of course, from the local officials to be companions for the 20 Dutchmen that were over there. So yes, that was an actual thing to keep them happy to, you know, make sure that the trade kept going because this was the only place in Japan that you could legally do any trade with anyone that was non-Japanese, uh, particularly with Western Europeans. The ships that came, um, they were not allowed to carry weapons. They were not allowed to, well, be on self-defense, kind of like cannon. But they weren't allowed to trade weapons. They weren't allowed to have books brought to shore. You could bring it onto Dejima, but they weren't allowed to leave Dejima. So they, the Japanese, every ship that came through, the Japanese would go, okay, hang on. And they would go on board and they would inspect the entire ship, make sure nothing weird was going on allow the trade to happen, inspect the ship again, then allow the ship to go. So that was basically life on Dejama. It's, uh, it was very routine. Um, in the, about the 200 years of, or so existence of Dejama, the island, about 600 or so uh, ships made it from, the, from European countries to there to trade. Now that doesn't sound like a lot over 200 years, but keep in mind that we're talking about sail technology and the fact that the Japanese were very controlling about what came in and out of their country. So that happened for a few, a couple hundred years until the Americans showed up 
and just opened up the entire country and made Dejama obsolete. We're going to wrap up this Dejama segment with the Americans coming in 1853 and opening up Japan to the world through uh, passive aggressive treaty making and uh, making sure that Japan trades with all the rest of the world, Western European, Chinese, Koreans, whomever wants to trade. And that creates a whole new era in, uh, in Japanese history. It also made the idea of, the, of Dejima a moot point and it actually created a better solution, kind of. Dejima, just as in the anime as it is in real life, was not a good idea. It was a band-aid to, in an effort to kind of hold off the decision making on something that was nobody really wanted to talk about. What do we do with all the foreigners? And it's a touchy subject. Even today, it's still a touchy subject. What do you do? Because it's not, there's no easy solution. It's a complex problem. And Dejima, unfortunately, was a simple solution that could not last forever. So that is Dejima in a nutshell. The Warring States period. A time where the Empire of Japan fell to internal strife and greed, bloodshed and violence. A time of constant war and chaos. And the setting of the ever popular anime known as Inuyasha. So for those of you who have lived under a rock and probably don't know what the premise of the anime is. Let me just recap it for you real quick. So a descendant of a shrine priestess falls into a well. The well is magical. The well takes her to the Sengoku period or the Warring States period. There she meets a dog demon named Inuyasha. Okay, so they pal together and they're fighting against this devil guy warlock thing called Naraku. And in doing so, they come across the Shikan Jewel, which is accidentally destroyed by the descendant of the Shine Priestess named Kagome. So the rest of the series is them collecting the shards and battling Naraku along the way, picking up friends and creating a little party of adventurers. And it's a wonderful little series, and there are demons, there are monsters, there are warlords, all this kind of stuff that's going on that they have to go up against every week in every episode. And the backdrop of all this is perfect, which is the Sengoku area of the Warring States period. And the reason why it's perfect, because this is a, one, a little over 100 years of nothing but chaos and mayhem that went on in real life. So if you want to make a story where you want to throw a lot of mythology into it and stories and not want to have to worry about like, you know, certain factual things, this is perfect because there really is, in real life, this was an awful time. <laughs> People died horribly. And it was nothing but chaos. Like I said, chaos and mayhem. So the actual period itself, people give it a couple different date ranges, but it's usually about uh, 1467 to 1568 or 1603, depending upon how you want to look at the Battle of Sekirohara and how you want to look at Oba Nobunaga. Um, it, it, it's a time where Jap uh, or Japan, the, the Empire of Japan, literally fell apart. And it fell into uh, disunity. All these different little warlords from, you know, like large provinces to little tiny towns. They're all vying for power. They're all getting revenge on somebody else. There's nothing to stop them from doing anything that they don't want to do. And it's just a period of time. It's just a period of suck, honestly. And if you were a peasant in Japan during this 100 to about 104 years or so, it, you almost just wanted to find a cave and just stay there because so many bad things were going on at the time. So what happened? It, it, Japan had enjoyed centuries of peace, of relative peace, and uh, you know being led by an emperor and going on, you know, going back centuries. So what happened? Why did Japan suddenly fall apart? Why did the Sengoku era happen? <laughs> So basically, how did the empire fall apart, the empire of Japan? How did it just fall to pieces like that? Well, it took time. And there are three major reasons as to what happened, basically what happened. And the first is the decline of the emperor's power itself. The second part of it is the decline of the shogunate's power. Both of those things took time. 
The third is an event that happened that kicked off basically the 100 years of suck, and that was the Onin War. So let's start with the decline of the emperor's power. How did the emperor lose his power? Oddly enough, the emperor gave it away. That's essentially what happened. Um, so just to give you an idea of governance in, in the empire of Japan, it went from a clan system to a royal system where you had kings and queens, and it went to an imperial system where you had an emperor or an empress and an imperial court. And basically what happened in 1199 is the emperor said, you know what, I'm kind of done dealing with the day-to-day -day minutia of running an empire. Now keep in mind that the empire of Japan at this point was really kind of limited to the island of Honshu, a couple of other places. It wasn't as we know Japan today. They, were, they had influence in those other areas, but the actual empire was smaller than that. But still, the empire went on for a good many centuries. Uh, there wasn't that much civil strife, um, internal conflicts. The um, Most of their wars were either defending against invasions or doing invasions. So, you know, so that's really all, all it was. That's where the violence came from. So in 1199, the emperor thought, well, you know, things are going really well, basically. Uh, things are, are fine. The vassal system is running. For those of you who want to know what the vassal system is, it's, it's basically... You know, you're the emperor, then you tell the next person down, you know, the next level, you say, okay, these are my orders. Those persons take, those those lords go to the next level of lords. They go to the next level. And they keep going down the chain to the, you know, the guy who might, you know, run a small town and on the other side of the island. So, basically, it's a trickle-down theory of power. And it seemed to work all right. Now... When the emperor decided that he wasn't going to do the minutia of day-to-day -day governance with the imperial court, he decided that he was going to give up that power to someone whom he thought was responsible. Someone who would take it seriously, who would do, run the day-to-day, -day, be okay with doing the day-to-day, -day, and being able to communicate and go out and make the orders necessary to do what the emperor wanted. Now, this doesn't mean that the emperor stopped having like the power of over life and death and, and or things or or create edicts and say this is what I want the country to do this is the direction I want the country to go in no he still had those kind of powers it was just the kind of the day-to-day -day kind of law and order type stuff that he wanted to give up and so that's what the shogun was was created for so he this emperor created a shogunate um, and the very first shogunate occurred in 1199 and the emperor said here you go here are all these powers and of course, who does he give it to? Well, he gives it to the person who's best able to communicate to the vassals and to all the military that, that belongs to his vassals, and that is his best military leader. So this emperor in 1199 created the first military dictatorship in Japan by giving up, voluntarily giving up his own power to another person. So let's talk about that. So in 1199, the emperor gives up his power to a guy named Yorimoto. He is the best guy in their military, in the Japanese military. He's the head of the military, and he proclaims him as the first shogunate. Um, Yorimoto is from Kamakura, so it becomes the Kamakura shogunate. And from then on, there's only three shogunates that go on, the last one being the, Ash uh, the uh, Ashikaga shogunate, which is we'll get to in a moment. So after the emperor relinquishes his all of his power, to this guy Yorimoto. Yorimoto takes charge and he runs the day-to-day -day happenings of the Empire of Japan. So things go pretty well for a while. The shogunate seems to work. The shogunate system seems to work. There's law and order. Again, there's not that much civil strife. There's, you know, every now and again there's a rebellion, but, you know, it's, it doesn't last long and it's dealt with pretty quickly. And again, they're either invading or defending from invasions. That's pretty much it. So it goes on for a very long time. Now the deal about a shogunate is just like the clan system in that it's hereditary. So the next person who is, is born, the next male heir that is born, gets the title of the shogunate. So Yorimoto gives it to his son, his son gives it to his son, you get the idea. So when the, uh, your, when the Kamakura shogunate is unable to produce heirs, the emperor at that time steps in and says, hmm, Who's the next best capable military leader that I can do this for? And he picks someone, and that person is appointed by the emperor, 
and then that person creates the new shogunate and then it starts over again the hereditary goes on from son to son to son to son things go swimmingly nothing bad happens the shogunate is pretty much in, in, in tight control until the Ashigaga shogunate now meanwhile while this is happening like I said the Emperor pretty much gives up his power now at this point you're probably asking so why doesn't the shogunate just take over and become Emperor well here's the reason the Emperor is considered by not only the shogunate but by the people themselves as a person of divinity not necessarily a god themselves but basically of gods so they believe that and the shogunate believes that as well so you're not really gonna want to anger the gods by killing one of their own and taking their place right so there's that but even if you didn't believe that the emperor uh, and uh, the imperial court did a very interesting thing one thing that they were very very good at was the justice system so the emperor became a symbol of justice so people left the emperor and the imperial court basically alone and it was actually a pretty good idea to try and suck up to the emperor and get favors from them because if if the emperor favored you then that means that the the court of justice favors them so it makes you look good so the emperor was was never in danger of being kicked out by by a shogunate so then we get the Ashikaga shogunate again at first pretty strong people they they do the job they do the job well until they don't so what prevented the Ashikaga shogunate from continuing well they weren't able to produce a male heir to directly to the son of the previous Ashikaga shogun so you would say okay well isn't the Emperor supposed to step in and say okay we're gonna appoint the new heir well yeah but here's what happened so the Emperor kind of looked around and said okay well I'm going to have to make a choice here do I continue with the current shogunate and the answer was yes because there were a lot of samurai families involved with the Ashikaga uh, shogunate so he knew that if he created a new one he might tick these people off and there might be a rebellion so he wanted to be able to appoint an heir from within the problem was was that there was nobody in the Ashikaga shogunate family that was strong enough to do it they were either way too young the cousins or you know second cousins third cousins whatever were too young they were too inept they were too whatever unworthy of the position so he couldn't immediately go in there but there were two very powerful samurai families that had married into the shogunate that decided that also stepped in and decided that they had claims to the shogunate and the emperor had to choose one of their people to be the next shogun hence the onin war the onin war kicked off the sengoku the warring states period and this is how this this period of of misery and mayhem and death and sorrow and despair happened it happened because the emperor couldn't choose he couldn't choose between two samurai families because he was too afraid of a rebellion that might happen as a result so here's what did happen so by not choosing someone and by choosing and by saying seeing who would come out on top and hoping that somebody from the Ashikaga family would actually produce somebody and say here's our guy to be the next Shogun which they never really did um, the two powerful samurai families who married into the Ashikaga family the Hosokawas and the Yamanas they said well we have people we're married into there so we have family in the in the shogunate who are more than capable of doing this because we are samurai families we come from samurais we're warriors you should choose one of us and if you don't we're just gonna just be mad and angry so the Emperor did nothing and so one night literally one night the two families main mansions in Kyoto the capital of, of Japan at the time across the street from each other right one side started throwing arrows at the other then one side started throwing fire at the other side and the other side had like a little bit of gunpowder attached to an arrow and sent it to the other side and then the other side did the same thing and for about a year in Kyoto there was a war inside of Kyoto between these two samurai families for that first year it was just stuck inside the Kyoto it was just in the city it didn't spread out just yet 
everyone was just kind of seeing who would come out on top and, and hope that the Emperor would go, fine, I choose the winner, right? That didn't happen. So the war starts to spread for this part of Kyoto, and it goes throughout the entire city. And as the entire city is being engulfed in literal flames and chaos and mayhem and people coming from the countryside looting the city, they managed to destroy Kyoto. That's right. These two samurai families vying for the power of the shogunate destroy the city. The emperor has to leave the city so that his palace can be rebuilt because it's all burned down. And these two families are still going at it. And then it bleeds out into the local provinces. At this point, this is when all the other lords, from top to bottom, the, the, the weakest to the strongest, look at these two families, realize that the emperor is going to choose one of these two people, one of these two families, to be the next shogun. And they want to make sure that they're on the right side. So one side chooses the Hosokawas, and one side chooses Yamanas. A massive civil war starts. This is the Onin War. It engulfs the entire empire. One side going after the other just to see who the emperor is going to put as the next shogunate and then hopefully rule of law will follow. The war goes on and the Hosokawas and the Yamanas manage to kill all of each other. They're all dead. There is no winner of the Onin War. The Onin War has no winner. The emperor can't really choose anyone of consequence, so he just arbitrarily chooses Nashikaga, who's weak, and the best that that person can do is protect the now rebuilt Kyoto, and that's it. And the rest of the empire <laughs> falls apart, and hence the rest of the Sengoku period happens of, again, chaos, mention, um, mayhem, famine, disease, poverty, you name it. If you're a peasant during this time, life is awful. All to thanks to the fact that an emperor couldn't, couldn't, couldn't decide. He just couldn't decide. Now, as I've been describing that life during the Sengoku period, the Warring States period, is full of mayhem and chaos and misery. Um, let me give you a little bit more of an idea of what was going on as a, if you were an average Japanese person living during that time. So basically, you spend your day farming. That's pretty much what you do. You, you spend your day, you go out there, you do a, hard, a lot of hard work, and you're, and you're basically um, providing services or goods for whoever is the lord above you, who is, who is controlling your village, whether it be on the clan level, the lord level, diama level, whatever. And as you're going through your hard enough day, you know there are things that you have to deal with, and one of them being, of course, malnutrition. Um, that's natural during a fuel, fuel time, fuel era. Also, things that you have to worry about are sickness. There's not a whole lot of remedies out there. So, you know, any, any kind of that challenges you would think of a feudal era of any civilization, they had to face too. It was a tough life. And that's during the good times. When the Sokoku period happened, you had, you had to deal with the normal life, which was hard enough. And then you had to deal with things like bandits, small armies of bandits, usually 40 to 150 these guys just come to your village, take your all your rice, and they go, sucks to be you, and they ride off. The tax collector from your lord comes in and goes, where's your rice? And you say, well, the bandits stole it, and they go, well, you better come up with something or else you're going to be punished. You had to deal with that. And then if that wasn't bad enough, then what would happen is that more often than not, there would be a war happening or there would be a battle going on on the next ridge, which means that it will probably hit your village and people kind of don't care about your village or you, so they're probably gonna, you stand a pretty good chance of having your home and all your possessions being burnt to the ground or stolen. Um, you have a good chance of your wife or daughter being raped. Um, you know, so you, you get to deal with those things. And on top of all that, some of the more physically able men would be, then be chosen by certain samurai. Samurai would come down and they would ride in and they'd go, um, bring out all the men of the village. Um, let's see here, there's about 50 of you, 40 of you look like you're good enough to hold a spear, you're coming with us. So you're immediately drafted, you're given a piece of cloth or a hat that denotes which lord you happen to be fighting for that day. They give you a spear, they give you rudimentary training with that spear so you can be stabby with it. 
and then off the battle you go and you hope to God that you live. That's the average day of a of a Japanese person in um, the Warring States period. So, you know, things are, are bleak. And then, you know, of course, there's famine. There's, you know, there's shortages. There's, you know, t poverty and, and taxation and just... Everything is piling on top of each other, and there just doesn't seem to be any any end of it in sight. So, for basically, what amounts to two generations of Japanese people had to endure a time of such suck that they were just willing just to go. You know what? I'm just gonna I'm I'm going over to the cliff. See ya, bye. You know. I mean, it, it was just a horrible time to live. A very horrible, bleak, bleak time, and you know, there just seemed to be no end in sight. And what people were wishing for was somebody strong enough to end it. It took a little over a hundred years, but it did end. And it does end. It ends, um, depending on who you talk to, 1568, when Obanaga pretty much conquers the entire of Japan and starts in establishing the rule of law again. Or some people would say 1603, which is when the Tokugawa uh, shogunate firmly ensconces its own power. Uh, either way, it does end, the misery does end, and we get Inuyasha. <laughs> okay, no. Inuyasha is not a direct response to um, all, the, all the misery of the, the Warring States period. But it's interesting that this anime uses that as a focal point for what they do in the anime, how they travel around what things are like in Japan. You know, you notice that the people are not exactly happy. They're not exactly, you know, they're having a hard time with things and there's things going on around them. You know, set aside the, the demon part and the fantastical part, you know, they're still dealing in the anime with warlords. They're dealing with bandits. They're dealing with human evil, not just spiritual evil, but human evil. And that's the thing about the Warring period, States period is that it was an evil time. Nobody really did that well in terms of morality during this period of time. It was like being lost in the wilderness. And Inuyasha kind of plays on that point, on that the anime plays on that point of that of that historical period where, you know, here is this plucky group of adventurers wandering around this basically moral, uh, you know, this this wasteland of human morals. You know, it's, it's like people just trying to get by, just living day to day. And it's, you know, you see the characters kind of being grateful for that campfire, kind of being grateful for that weak soup. Because after a while, they discover that, you know, you know the, the life is tough, life is hard. Especially during Warring States period, where every, any day can be, your, really could be your last day. So, um, this is another great use of history in anime, I feel. And while Inuyasha does have, is upbeat and can be funny and things like that, I think it makes good use of the historical period. So before I wrap this up, this panel up, um, I just uh, I, I know I'm probably going to get this question at, at some point, but um, I think in Yuyasha, based on the can uh, the canon of the anime and the movies, um, I think that it takes place in the time period of 1543 and 1547. Um, there's a couple other people out there who did the kind of did the math and we all kind of come up within the same area Give or take a few years. Maybe I don't know um, That's that's my best guess. So if that's a question that you have there you go I think that Inuyasha took place between 1543 and 1547 um, Other than that, thank you for watching my panel. Um, I'm glad that you watched it and I hope that uh, hope You'll ask me some questions because I'd love to answer your questions and I hope you enjoy the rest of Oncom 4. Thank you.